how can I potentially make a profit on a player? I, I'm not building to roster bait. You can tell how much I believe in Nick Chubb because I just blew past him completely. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the DU Trade Archives. This episode, Jake is going to take us through some mistakes and how he turned those mistakes into a positive outcome. If you haven't been with us before, we are looking at past trades and trying to learn something from them. So without further ado, let's hop right into it. We're going to bring up on our screen here a couple of screenshots, one from MFL and one from Sleeper because we moved our leagues from MFL to Sleeper this year. So Jake, walk us through, I guess, your thought process on this trade back in 2022 where you moved to a and a third for Trevor Lawrence. And I'm actually going to show the full team here so we can just get a, a little idea of kind of what the roster looks like. Cool. So go ahead, walk us through it, Jake. What's yeah, that? so... As you saw, the date was late December. I think it might even been New Year's Eve. Uh, we're talking going yep. into the, I want to say the championship for uh, DU2. And I saw, I thought to myself, you know, I just got knocked out in the semis. How can I potentially make a profit on a player in the playoffs for a team that I think needs potentially running back assistance? So in that trade, uh, Nick Chubb was also thrown in there. Um, I was pretty low on Chubb going into the end of the year, just knowing he was a 26-year-old running back, um, wanted to try and get off of him and potentially, in my mind, tear up a quarterback, but also get off of a quarterback that I thought was dealing with uh, per perpetual head injuries that could potentially um, derail his career. And one of the reasons that I wanted to bring this up specifically for the, the TU Trade Archive is because I wanted to think and talk a little bit more about why process is really important. And I went down my own path of process, which I think inherently actually had me kind of lose out on this trade. I think I overpaid a little bit at the time, given market value for Trevor Lawrence. Um, I think maybe in the long run, this trade actually probably evened out pretty pretty well, just given, unfortunately, the Nick Chubb knee injury um, and just yeah. the, the entire situation around uh, both players. But at the time, I think it's really important to not try and diagnose other players' medical history like mm -hmm. you yourself know better. And in this situation, I do happen to have some of my own personal biases uh, without jumping into them too significantly, just like dealing with uh, concussions in the past myself, I thought I knew better than what medical doctors were, you know, basically diagnosing Tua with in this particular circumstance and allowing him to play and in some situations get multiple concussions in a pretty short period of time. So in my mind, I thought I had really a very risky asset and I wanted to get off of him as fast as I could, but kind of hide that fear in a trade that made sense for both teams. And so that's really where this first trade came from. What are your thoughts? Yeah, no, that's, I, I mean, that's great history on kind of how this trade came about. You can tell how much I believe in Nick Chubb because I just blew past him completely <laughs> when first, when first talking about this deal. So yeah, this was to a Nick Chubb, a third for Trevor Lawrence back in 2022. So this was still Nick Chubb of the past and you were trying to get ahead of any Nick Chubb downfall uh, yeah. decline right and and so obviously you know i think this is the juxtaposition with dynasty that troubles a lot of managers which is like trying to both balance risk which which you were trying to do but also balance the get out a year too early before a year too late mentality of aging players right yep which we often overstate we, we definitely overstate now with this one i mean you you said yourself a little bit before we hopped on or during this, I don't remember, but you said you got a little lucky here, right? Where it ended up kind of working out for you in the end anyway. So, you know, the process, I think you, you kind of know where the process was flawed a little bit and you know, kind of that you wouldn't do that exact trade, you know, today. So, so we've learned something there. And I think you've, you learned that along the way already. Now let's go to the, the second phase of, of this trade, uh, this trade archive ep episode. You then ended up moving Trevor Lawrence. So, you know, talk to us a little bit about why, you know, you thought that after acquiring Trevor Lawrence, you had the flexibility to to be able to move on from him. And just real quick, I'll, I'll throw the trade out there. 
Jake sent Trevor Lawrence, Puka Nakua, and a 26 first big boy trade right here for a Tyreek Hill, Jamar Chase, a 25 second and a 26 second. Big, big, big boy trade here. Go ahead and walk us through why you thought this was a good idea. Yeah, I think in Superflex, automatically, most people would say to themselves, I'm probably going quarterback, elite wide receiver, first round pick. And I think it's really important to kind of look at the roster construction mm -hmm. a little bit and understand why I went the path I did. I, I did get a little lucky in drafting Jordan Love in startup, got him pretty late on, uh, thinking that Aaron Rodgers was going to go sooner or later. You know what? He ended up leaving sooner or later. <laughs> and I found myself with another sure. potentially top 10 QB asset, right? Like Jordan Love is, is teetering on, you know, QB – uh, 12, 13, 14 period with some people and even hopping into the top 10 for others. And honestly, for me, he's probably closer to top 10 than top 15. Whereas Trevor Lawrence for me was kind of moving in the wrong direction, but I knew that the market was still in favor of Trevor. And so I figured I can bundle him in a package with a wide receiver that I'm also not necessarily incredibly high on in Puka for what I believe is still a top two wide receiver in Jamar Chase, plus a top 15 wide receiver in Tyreek Hill, who I think in terms of production is still going to produce at an elite level um, this upcoming season and potentially in the future season as well. I thought I was also potentially giving myself a, a circumstance and almost an out. If everything doesn't go well this year, I can still get off of Tyreek for probably somewhere between a mid to late first and feel pretty comfortable with it, depending on his production. You know, the higher his production is even at 30, 31, or he's 29 right now. Um, I could still probably finagle something between the 107 to 109 and feel pretty confident in my return for next year and then keep moving forward. But really it does come down to roster construction right now. I'm looking at Jalen Hurts and Jordan Love as my two starting quarterbacks didn't really have the space for Trevor. And I figured it might be a cheap enough alternative for me to use some of my either depth um, that I have or my other uh, future assets to potentially trade for a third quarterback because I don't have a third starter right now, which is obviously very risky and I'm conscientious of that. But it did put my wide receiver room as Justin Jefferson, A.J. Brown, uh, Amon Ross St. Brown, Keenan Allen, Tyreek Hill, and Jamar Chase. And so from just a pure competition standpoint, like – I know and I expect this team to be competing as a top three team this upcoming season, just based off of the way that I've also reviewed some of the other rosters in the league. Obviously, anything can happen with regards to injury, but I do feel like this team right now is in its most uh, competitive circumstance, plus adding on those two additional uh, future assets, which I think are really important, actually, because with the way that this team is built, and the way that I'm valuing my own future picks, I do think that this for, uh, 2026 first could be potentially late. And I do think that those two 25 seconds, uh, the 25 second and the 26 second, based off of the manager that I'm working with, I know that there's a good chance that those could be early. So if I'm landing somewhere between, you know, two 202s or two 203s, and I'm giving up a 112, it doesn't feel as weighted as I think from first glance uh, looking at this. Uh, given the fact that, you know, one side is Trevor Lawrence, Puka Nakua, and a 2026 first, whereas the other side is an aging wide receiver, probably wide receiver two slash three, and two seconds. The last thing I did want to say before I ask you about how you feel about these moves is really, like, a lot of my um, pivoting here has a lot to do with the way that I want to kind of structure this team moving forward, mm -hmm. but also at the same time as trying to get the most out of assets that I don't think necessarily are going to continue to move forward. I know that sounds like an oxymoron because how much higher can Jamar Chase really grow, right? He probably can't grow that much higher, but I think the gap between Jamar Chase and Puka Nakua can grow. I think the gap between Jamar Chase and Trevor Lawrence can grow in the sense that I think Jamar Chase can continue to produce at a relatively high level, while those those players may not produce at the same level in which people expect them to produce or have produced in the past, i.e. Puka Nakua, probably not so much for Trevor Lawrence. That's still more so of a, a future gains uh, perspective for others. And so that's kind of the way that I saw these two trades and how they kind of worked out uh, in the future. What are your thoughts about the second trade? Yeah, it's super interesting. I mean, I think that, 
some of what anybody thinks about these trades is going to hinge a little bit on your perspective of Puka Nakua because you obviously think that there isn't much growth potential in his profile. And I think that some would believe that he can maintain and or exceed what we've seen from him. So, I I mean, I think, I I don't think I necessarily fall strongly either way. I think that he's really good. That's probably where I fall, but I just, I just think that it's worth noting that that is probably a big influence on this trade and, and how anybody would feel about it. That said, I think what you've done is really interesting in this league. If we look at the roster, you know, we, we, I just got done recording with Tommy B of the Superflex Super Show, and he talks a lot about exerting influence on your league mates. And there's a number of ways you can do that. And I think right now, you know, in general, uh, the better way, the better ways, the best ways to do that are through elite quarterbacks and elite tight ends. But you can see what you've done here is you've created this dynamic where every single team you go up against, you have a significant advantage in terms of value over replacement at the wide receiver position. And almost nobody is going to compete with you. Like literally nobody is going to compete with you. And you're hoping that essentially you make up your points at at tight end with your, your quarterbacks. I mean, I'm sorry, with your, your wide receivers. But I think it's really interesting that essentially you pinpointed, okay, I can literally acquire all of the top end wide receivers. Like that's, that's what you were able to do here. And I don't think that you would have been able to do this if you didn't have three elite quarterbacks, right? Like you weren't, you aren't going to go out and trade Trevor Lawrence if you don't have Jordan Love and Jalen Hurts. So, you know, obviously you want to have a surplus of assets to be able to do this kind of thing, but that is where you should try to get any roster at. And and this is another Tommy B ism. I'll, I'll say it, but acquiring as many top end quarterbacks as you can. And if you build your roster out that way, you know, from the startup, or if you're taking over an orphan, you're going to be able to exert the kind of influence that Jake was able to exert here. He had a surplus of the most important position in the format and was able to turn that into not losing anything at quarterback. He's still going to, I shouldn't say not losing anything. He's losing depth, but he's not losing any points at quarterback. And he's enhanced his point scoring ability at the wide receiver position and of his overall roster twofold, really. I mean, in terms, you know, of giving up what he gave up and what he's getting back, he's getting back Jamar Chase, Tyree Kill, two assets that are going to slot right into his roster and give him more points than the 26 first and Puka are going to give him no matter what. And again, like I said, Trevor Lawrence isn't going to make it into the roster most of the time. I love the thought process of what you're doing and It's very team build specific, but it makes so much sense for this roster. And we can't lose sight of the fact that context is super, super important in any trade we make. And that's honestly why we're looking at these kind of things in the trade archives to go back and say, yeah, like when your team build calls for it, you make trades like this and you make it work. And yes, like starting from, you know, a potential mistake that was made, understanding that you you created more depth on your roster than you need at at the most valued position in fantasy, and then you turned it into something that is probably going to make your roster a a league winning roster. Yeah, if everyone stays healthy, I think I'm. Yeah, you know, yeah. You know I'm putting myself in a, in a situation where that's definitely the case, right? And so, yes, yeah, yes. I mean, I just want to say one more thing. That's a super viable strategy. Like depth is overrated to an extent in dynasty. Depth is great to have in terms of of. Um, liquidation and, and uh tradeability and also it's it's good to have functionally of course but it's not necessary and having all elite assets and not much depth is a hundred percent a viable way to win a win a dynasty league i've done it multiple times um so that's you know this is, it's a very viable strategy there is some risk involved there but you like jake said at the beginning of this can find a way usually to backfill that qb3 spot which we know the value of a replacement in that spot is pretty flat. So like, if you want to go get a guy, you can just go get a guy mid season and go get your Jake Browning if you want or whatever. If you really want to backfill it with something that is going to be more likened to a Trevor Lawrence or a more sustainable QB two production, you, you'll find, you can find a different way to do that, but there's many ways to backfill that spot. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And you know, this strategy is very team dependent as billy alluded to and i'm not here telling people that you need to necessarily lose out potentially on on trades on both surface level and in calculators but at the same time 
I do think that this trade looks like a loss, but in my opinion, at the end of the day, is going to help this team actually progress instead of move backwards in the future, even though I'm potentially losing future value because at the end of the day, we're playing this game to win money, not necessarily just have the most amount of fantasy value on your team in this one given season. So that's kind of the way that I had to kind of differentiate how I'm looking forward. I'm not building to roster bait. I thought, well, I thought I was just building to to, <laughs> to make myself feel really good at the end of the day by looking at this roster. Well, when you when you go over to the next slide, that's literally all I do every day. <laughs> yeah, right. Roster, like, I'm just like, look oh, at what God. I've done. Oh, it's so look good. Yeah, uh, honestly, I could probably I could probably find a way to get Travis Kelsey at some point this season for like a second, well, one of those seconds yeah. that I sent out, and I can get that elite tight end. So it's like. Those are the types of situations that I'm looking at for teams like this and still find myself with Jake Ferguson next year. And, you know, I start to reroll the same things that I already had and it's totally fine. I don't, I don't lose out on anything. I just lose out on that future second, but that's the game that you play. Honestly, I learned a lot from, I'll shout him out. Will Dennison um, in our console wars league does a very similar strategy to this. And the man finds a way to compete in a 36 team league as a top four to six team every single season. So, you know, shout out to Will. Um, I know we don't necessarily talk all the time, but whenever we send out trades, we have really in-depth conversations. Honestly, super intuitive guy. And really, if you ever get a chance to look at any of his roster builds, you would think to yourself like, wow, that team's aging out. Wow, that team's absolute shit. But what is it now? Five, six years in a row? Yeah. Dude's competing at the highest level in a 36 team league. So just... Just something to be mindful of. You know, it's not always about immediate fantasy value uh, in terms of what you know KTC is providing you or DTC, but it's more so about what are the points that are going to be hitting this team on a week by week basis, and that's something to be thoughtful of. And I think that's why we're here to talk through the uh, DU trade archive. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I love the shout of, about being able to to continue building this roster out with what you've done here, and you can add to it like adding a tight end, you could easily turn Jake Ferguson plus something into, like you said, Travis Kelsey, maybe a Mark Andrews. We've seen the value super low. So there's a lot of opportunity there once you you've kind of gotten it to this point. So yeah, you're going to like, like Jake said, we're here to learn something. And as you kind of, if you've seen the first couple episodes, we're talking about different stuff every time. Some of them are just like huge mistakes that we've made and, and recovering from those. This one, I don't think is, is necessarily like that. This one was more, I think this was more of an oversight in terms of process, where as you went along, not only did you learn from that oversight, but you were also able to take the asset that you gained and elevate your roster, right? And so it wasn't so much like fixing a terrible mistake, but it was learning from one and also, you know, understanding your team build and being able to move forward and extend kind of the your 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 window to win with what you've done so i really enjoy going through these with jake we're always learning something i'm hoping to bring on new guests eventually as well kind of walk through their trades see if we can you know learn something from other people's experience because there's plenty out there doing um really good stuff that i think we could we could bring on here and and learn from so thank you for joining us for this episode of the du trade archives please subscribe to your youtube channel and stay tuned for more peace out